I would like to welcome you to our online workshop on integrative modeling of brain energy metabolism. And um, today's event is organized as part of a unique collaboration uh, between KAUST and the PFL Blue Brain Project um, that has been initiated and led by uh, Pierre Magistretti and Henry Markram with the goal to investigate brain energy metabolism using modeling. So this collaboration started in 2013 as a strategic alliance amongst these two institutions and then has uh, as follow on received funding from two competitive research grants from KAUST. And it's thanks to this collaboration that we, we essentially organized today um, this workshop. Myself, I'm Felix Schumann from APFL, and I'll get this first session kicked off. Now, um, what uh, we have for you is the event is organized in two parts. The first day today features four renowned speakers and the panel discussion, uh, taking different perspectives on glial cell and brain energy metabolism. Um, and as uh, Pierre had mentioned already, uh, it's very unfortunate we had uh, to learn this morning that Marcus Reichler had an uh, unforeseen medical reason, uh, so he informed us that he could not join us today. So we had to make an adjustment of the agenda. So we will not have session three, but instead we'll give the panel discussion a little bit more time. Now, tomorrow, we'll sort of obviously introduce that tomorrow. But uh, tomorrow, members of the KAUST EPFL Alliance will showcase different scientific highlights and achievements from the collaboration of, of which this workshop is part of. And then we will go into that more tomorrow. It will also start at 2 o'clock, um, like today, tomorrow. I would like to mention for um, uh, that the workshop is being recorded. And um, without much further ado, I would like to introduce the first keynote speaker, Pierre Magistretti. Um, and I've realized it's difficult to introduce Pierre in just a few words. He has led so many initiatives, has received so many prizes, and simply is a key figure in glial and brain energy metabolism research. Uh, he has published more than 240 research papers, so <laughs> it's difficult to summarize all of that. Currently, Pierre is a distinguished professor at the Division of Biological and Environmental Sciences and Engineering at KAUST. Uh, he has just recently completed his uh, long stint as dean there, and I think is again really very much focusing all his energy on science. Um, just, uh, I would like to ask you to hold your questions until the end of his presentation, and then we have time for discussion. And with that, Pierre, I'm very much looking forward to hand it over to you, and um, you'll take it from here. So, well, thank you very much, uh, Felix, uh, for the introduction, also introducing uh, the, the reason why we have this meeting, it's been really a fantastic collaboration um, um, between KAUST and uh, EPFL uh, and uh, to, to really put into a modeling framework many of the biological uh, findings that uh, um, my lab and other labs had done in um, uh, clar um, characterizing this neuron glia uh, metabolic coupling and the contribution uh, to brain energy metabolism. So it's actually a, a nice, let's put it like this, celebration of, of uh, yeah, seven years of collaboration. And I hope there will be other ways to continue the collaboration. So my interest uh, uh, on brain energy metabolism and neuron glia metabolic coupling uh, started many, many years ago. Um, uh, <laughs> I dare say, I think the first paper on this uh, that I uh, published was <laughs> was 40 years ago. It's kind of scary, but that's what the way it is. I was a, a young uh, um, graduate student uh, at uh, UCSD working at the Salk Institute with Floyd Bloom. And, and, and since then, um, the, 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 the really the, the main focus of my research is tried has been to try to understand, uh, with, uh, what are the mechanisms of coupling the uh, electrochemical events that occur at the synapse with metabolic responses with their uh, with their relevance to um, several aspects of brain research, uh, neuroenergetics, the way the modern way to say brain energy metabolism, and then over the years this moved into trying to better understand neuronal plasticity and even more recently focusing on how this metabolic coupling can be involved in diseases when it is not properly functioning. So uh, just for those uh, who are not familiar with the um, astrocytes, as you know, they are 
uh, belong to the broader family of glial cells, microglia, the other microglia being oligodendrocytes, and then microglial cells is yet another category. They have interesting features, these astrocytes. Uh, as you can see here at the ultrastructural level, this is uh, work that was done by Graham Knott actually at EPFL. Um, a 3D reconstruction of a synapse, you see presynaptic, postsynaptic, and here these blue lamellae are actually astrocytic processes that ensheath the synapses. This ensheathing is not fixed, it's actually quite dynamic, plastic, but just keep in mind that in the rodent, a single astrocyte can interact with over 100,000 synapses, so it's pretty pervasive. On the other end, if I may say, astrocytes have processes that uh, uh, ensheath a uh, cover um, uh, capillaries. In fact, almost the entire capillary system in the brain. And uh, you can see here in negative, uh, a capillary stained by um, astrocytes that have been abutting on it and that are a stain for GFAP. And here it's an image from Corrado Cali, who was a speaker uh, and, and longtime collaborator. You can see here this end foot uh, uh, on an, a capillary and, and this vast uh, branching uh, of astrocytes. <clears throat> so in, in an artistic way here, you see the, the main concept here of what has become really a key point of our collaboration uh, with the EPFL and the Blue Brain Project, the NGV, the Neuron Glial Vascular Unit, with the astrocyte playing a key role uh, in coupling these two elements, the source of energy, capillaries covered by this end feet, which express transporters for glucose, of course, which is the main energy substrate of the brain, but also um, for uh, monocarboxylates such as lactate, uh, but at a much lower rate than, than glucose, <clears throat> and also amino acids. And then the other processes, those processes that surround the synapse um, express receptors and reuptake sites. Uh, so it means that these astrocytes can sense synaptic activity. And I'm just highlighting um, two of the main functions of astrocyte, as we will see metabolic and energetic support. They contribute to neuronal plasticity, but of course, they can recycle uh, and remove, in particular, glutamate uh, from um, the extracellular fluid, which is very important to protect neurons who avoid excitotoxicity. Uh, and overall, they kind of um, maintain the physiological uh, condition in the extracellular milieu, and they provide uh, this notion that, that has emerged over time of gliotransmission, meaning that signals released by astrocytes at the close or in the proximity of the synapse can contribute to uh, actual neurotransmission. So let me go uh, through, the first, um, <clears throat> uh, through the first aspect uh, of, of our work that started, as I said, 40 years ago, highlighting the role of astrocytes in, in neuroenergetics. And you can see that's 40 years ago, because this is me 40 years ago. <laughs> I was in shorts in the lab, you know, you didn't need to wait to wear a, a white coat. Uh, many things have changed, as you can see. And this is my, my mentor, a great man, Floyd Bloom, who unfortunately is not in great health at the moment, but it really was an inspiring figure and has always been for me. But we published, as this was part of my PhD thesis, we observed that there was uh, a neurotransmitter or neuromodulator in the brain, VIP, that was promoting a metabolic effect in slices, uh, glycogenolysis. And uh, I didn't know two things when I was doing, before I started these experiments. One, that glycogen is uh, present only in uh, astrocytes. And so maybe, who knows, if I had known, maybe I wouldn't have done the experiments. Uh, and two, I didn't really know much about astrocyte anyway. But that, uh, I think it was the first example of a neurotransmitter or a molecule released by neurotransmitter acting on glial cells. Uh, so one of the first examples of neuron glia coupling, in this case, metabolic. Uh, and you can see that glycogen, these are the electron dense uh, granules or glycogen. You can see here the end foot. And then here you see the neuropil with synapses. So, uh, it was, um, as I said, one of the early demonstrations, if not the first one, that really uh, neurons can talk to uh, glial cells uh, uh, via uh, re receptors. 
So the conclusion of this work was very simple, was that there are uh, certain uh, molecules released by neurons. We actually had found that not only VIP, but also noradrenaline uh, could promote glycogenolysis and that this would somehow generically, that was the concept at the end of my uh, thesis, that uh, there could be a regulation uh, of energy metabolism in neuron mediated by astrocytes responding on demand to uh, neuronal signals. And, and we formulated this uh, in relation to the morphology of the neuronal systems that contain VIP and noradrenaline, VIP being these bipolar cells uh, that define cortical columns, they receive specific afferents. And so in my thesis, I propose that these cells were somehow uh, neurometabolic transducers receiving information in, by incoming volleys of, of neuronal activity and translating them into a metabolic response in astrocyte to provide energy within cortical columns. And then the other system <clears throat> that we <coughs> proposed was that um, the noradrenergic system is organized differently, you know, the cell bodies in the locus ceruleus, and then single noradrenergic fibers innervating globally the, the neocortex. And so the idea was that this system, which by the way is related to attention and learning uh, or memory consolidation, um, was somehow priming metabolically the cortex to um, uh, incoming uh, a specific activity. And as you will see uh, later on, we actually put together this old story with a newer story about memory. And the second mechanism that we described a few years ago uh, was uh, with uh, Luc Pellerin, who uh, joined my lab uh, in Lausanne uh, from Montreal, the Montreal Neurological Institute. And there we described that another neurotransmitter, in fact, a very prominent one, because it's released at 80% of the synapses, glutamate, uh, was actually promoting a metabolic response in astrocytes. And it was through its uptake, not through receptors. So the uptake of glutamate into astrocytes was a well-known mechanism at the end, important for maintaining glutamate homeostasis in the extracellular space. And we uh, described that this glutamate would promote aerobic glycolysis. What is this? It's actually the product, the use of glucose through glycolysis with at the end product being lactate rather than pyruvate. And so we proposed that it was a mechanism to couple neuronal activity, 80% of synapses use glutamate, to glucose utilization. Needless to say that uh, 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 this was a hard battle to fight because <laughs> there was skepticism that uh, astrocyte would do anything uh, useful. I remember asking one of the, 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 the main players in brain energy metabolism at the time, uh, what was the role of astrocytes in, in glucose uptake? He said, no, astrocytes are transparent to glucose. The glucose goes straight into neurons. Okay, that was my first presentation, I think, at, uh, at the meeting. Uh, I had another nice uh, comment by another prominent uh, neuroscientist uh, interested in metabolism at the time. He said, Pierre, what you just presented is a major conceptual step backwards. Yeah, you know, for a young investigator, it's quite encouraging to continue, but it didn't discourage me. I went, went on for another 30 years <laughs> and still going <laughs> with the same passion. But anyway, what we described with Luc was that glutamate uptake into, into astrocytes, which by the way, is a co-transport with sodium with a stoichiometer of three sodium ions with one glutamate, poses an uh, energetic demand on, on astrocytes because ATP is used to reestablish the sodium gradient through the NAK ATPase and glutamate, it, at least in part, recycled, uh, recycled back to neurons through the glutamate glutamine cycle. And both processes cost energy, means that the astrocytes uh, decreases its energy charge. This disinhibits uh, <clears throat> the glycolytic enzymes, glucose enters into uh, astrocytes. And again, our surprise was that. Uh, it was promoting lactate release. This is what was released from astrocytes to neurons. Um, <clears throat> by the way, that doesn't mean that glucose does not enter into neurons. Uh, there is some glucose uptake into neurons through glucose transporter three uh, in astrocytes and endothelial cells is glucose transporter one. And I will not have time today to elaborate on this, but mainly the glucose taken up by neurons is to feed the pentose phosphate shunt, which is important for 
production of reducing equivalence, uh, which is important for cells that are very oxidative, like neurons. So this gave rise to uh, the controversial in the 90s, astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle, uh, whereby um, glutamate stimulates uh, on demand glucose uptake into astrocytes, and we characterized all the steps with many students and postdocs. Again, I, I will not go in detail. This has been extensively published in many uh, <clears throat> in many papers. Uh, and now I, I think I dare say it's in textbooks, so it's a nice, uh, it's, it's a nice uh, achievement uh, with the notion also that astrocytes therefore are mainly glycolytic, they produce lactate and uh, neurons are mainly oxidative and this exchange of lactate takes place through specific monocarboxylate transporters, one and four in astrocytes, in particular four and two exclusively in neurons. Now this uh, shuttle became uh, enriched by work mainly by the group of uh, Felipe Barros showing that other stimuli associated with synaptic activity such as potassium or ammonium um, uh, can trigger the ANLS and even another component, a lactate channel that can actually release high volumes uh, of lactate in addition to the monocarboxylate transporters. <coughs> so, Actually, just here is Felipe. You'll see him in a moment. Felipe and, and Bruno uh, published a really very nice paper uh, showing that actually there is a gradient, a natural gradient between astrocytes and neurons that really is fully coherent with the astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle. I will not go in, uh, in details. This is a nice paper in cell metabolism. They showed in vivo by using um, genetically encoded uh, um, uh, sensors for uh, lactate that it would express in neurons and in astrocytes, that when you kind of open the gates for lactate, in other words, activate uh, the monocarboxylate transporters in astrocytes and neurons, spontaneously lactate will flow from astrocytes to neurons. You can see here, again, I'm going very quickly, a decrease upon this opening of the gates, a decrease in lactate in astrocytes and an increase in uh, lactate delayed with time in neurons. So again, really clearly showing this gradient. And then to conclude to this early phase, but I think it's, it's important because it's relevant to imaging, uh, we, um, uh, with Luke and others, we uh, thought, uh, well, if glutamate uptake is so important for glucose uptake into astrocytes, what if we downregulate the expression of this transporter and stimulate a pathway and then do to the oxyglucose imaging, a very classic way to see activity through glucose utilization. And so we downregulated this expression of, of the, the specific glial glutamate transporters uh, in the barrel field, specific barrel field uh, location, uh, which as you know, uh, it's the um, uh, 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 synaptic uh, uh, end point of this uh, um, <clears throat> um, uh, whisker to barrel pathway, physiological sensory pathway, you stimulate the vibrissa, and then one can see increase in glucose utilization, meaning activity <clears throat> in this corresponding barrel field. So what we did, we uh, injected uh, uh, oligonucleotide uh, uh, antisense uh, into a specific uh, barrel, uh, into a specific barrel, and just go here to the uh, last slide you see the control side, you stimulate, and you see a nice increase in 2-deoxyglucose uh, autoradiography signal. And on the side where you had injected the glutamate uh, transporter um, downregulation uh, <clears throat> in the astrocyte selectively, you actually um, don't see much of a signal, meaning that this uh, signal for uh, glucose uptake during activation is really mediated by this glutamate uh, uptake into astrocytes when glutamatergic neurons are activated. And later on, the group of Yuri Bushaki showed that indeed, again in vivo, when uh, he could actually monitor glucose uptake uh, or glucose presence in blood, astrocytes, and neurons. This is um, before activation in the barrel field. Okay, a lot of glucose in the blood, same about astrocytes and neurons, but during activation of the vibrissa, you see a massive increase only in astrocytes and not in neurons. So again, uh, another 
evidence for this. So this has implications for imaging. That's why I presented here today, even though it's older data, because uh, it means that when one sees a PET signal, a deoxyglucose signal, uh, there may be, of course, let's say in a massive neurodegeneration, less glutamate being released, less signal. But it can also be the case that this transduction mechanism that <clears throat> brings the glutamate into the astrocytes and triggers glucose uptake is perturbed. And uh, there are some, I, I don't have time to go into this today, but th there are some leads in particular in the APOE4 uh, positive uh, patients who are susceptible to uh, Alzheimer's, and they already have a massive decrease in glucose uptake, well, a significant decrease in glucose uptake before, well before any signal. And then uh, Luke uh, with a group at McGill a couple of years ago showed that if you do the opposite, you increase glutamate transporters in astrocytes, you actually increase the FDG PET signal. So I think there is really mounting evidence that for imaging, uh, for 2-deoxyglucose, um, this neuron glia metabolic coupling, the astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle is important. Now, let me move to the more recent work on um, neuronal plasticity and disease. So uh, early on, maybe 10 years ago or so, we started to ask our the question, uh, well, uh, we know a lot about neuronal plasticity as a basis of learning and memory with many mechanisms and pathways being involved in it at the neuronal level. But how about this ANLS? How this exchange between astrocytes and neuron? Uh, how is it regulated during plasticity? Is it upregulated? Is it maybe even necessary to have uh, neuronal plasticity? Uh, which is a bit of a provocative question. And so uh, we, I, I will go straight to the final, uh, what, not the final, I mean, the main paper in this, collab in this uh, uh, questioning that we have had, or the early one. A paper with Christine Alberini uh, and then at uh, Mount Sinai, now at NYU, where we showed in that if one blocks lactate transport from astrocytes to neurons, uh, then uh, long-term memory formation is impaired, which is quite interesting because you have a cell that was considered for a long time like a, not very interesting, some sort of glue, lactate, a metabolic end product. Well, both seems to be important with memory one of the higher brain functions. And in fact, one of my friends, uh, Alain Prochian, former administrator of the Collège de France, one day told me, you know, Pierre, you actually became very visible by studying the garbage of the brain, glia and lactate. <laughs> that was kind of, that has to be taken as a compliment from him. So anyway, uh, just very quickly, this uh, test, the inhibitory avoidant test, which was the memory test we used, you know, rodents like to go very quickly uh, into the dark component when you put them in this cage, one uh, lit, one dark component. And <clears throat> uh, so one measures latency. So um, 15 minutes before uh, training, uh, we gave actually an inhibitor of glycogen phosphorylase. Uh, the enzymes from which lactate is produced and, and glycogen is produced from uh, glucose, of course. So it's really the glycolytic pathway here. And we also, at some point, downregulated either MCT1 and 4, the astrocytic one, or the neuronal one, and then tested uh, for um, uh, long term memory. And, and again, I won't go through the details, but here is the just focused on this and this on these two ovals. Here you see that the, the animals that had received vehicle, uh, they actually take a long time to move into the dark compartment after training, 24 hours after training, because they remember there is something unpleasant happening. Whereas the animal uh, from which we had blocked the lactate production uh, through blocking glycolysis or exchange of lactate between astrocytes and neurons actually had a very short, <clears throat> a very short latency meaning that they didn't learn, but this is rescued by lactate. So if we co-inject a lactate plus a DAB, I mean DAB plus lactate, you prevent the loss of memory consolidation. And again, as a, um, just a summary, uh, the idea is that glycogenolysis and astrocyte neuron lactate shuttling are required for long-term memory formation. Even LTP uh, is blocked actually. Uh, in, in vivo under these conditions and rescued by lactate. Uh, we also uh, looked at not only an, uh, a, uh, a <clears throat> aversive memory, such as uh, inhibitory avoidance in the hippocampus, but also 
an appetitive memory, such as conditioned place preference to cocaine. And this is work by Benjamin Boutrel, Anthony Carrard, and uh, Benjamin Bourijamo. And uh, I was not there the day of the picture, so they were kind enough. They put a picture of me in the background. But what uh, uh, what uh, what they did? So this uh, is a place preference. You have two compartments. There also in one you give uh, cocaine, a cup of, uh, according to a certain protocol, and then uh, the other compartment they receive saline. And these two compartments are very very different in terms of a texture, maybe even sometimes odor. I mean, they can really distinguish both. And what happens when you retest them? Well, they will go straight where they, uh, they received cocaine. It's very strong uh, memory. But if you give DAB, you actually have no preference. You give lactate plus DAB, you rescue memory. And pyruvate doesn't do the effect. So another example of the key role of uh, lactate produced from astrocytes. <clears throat> and we can say really in this case, that that's also why glycogen is interesting because uh, it's only in astrocytes. And you know, therefore that the lactate uh, that is coming is coming directly from glycogen. So <clears throat> uh, since glycogen seems so important for memory consolidation for plasticity, with Corrado uh, and, and many of these, uh, <laughs> I used to call them slaves, <laughs> and maybe some of them are listening to the talk, uh, did really a, a titanic work uh, in, uh, and that was part of the Blue Brain Project collaboration, uh, reconstruct uh, and um, do segmentation on a volume of hippocampus. And you hear you have the segmentation, meaning that you identify on each slide, uh, on each section, sorry, uh, the profile belonging to an axon, to a dendrite or in green, to astrocytes, and, and there will be many presentations tomorrow about this, and also the attempts uh, to actually automatize this segmentation, which is extremely time consuming. But the really interesting part of, of this work was that uh, Corrado uh, could, could show that, uh, let me, I am sorry, maybe I should remove this for, uh, yeah, uh, was um, um, actually using this, uh, approach for a 3D, uh, the, I mean, the segmentation and reconstruction uh, to do a, a, a virtual reality full immersion uh, experience. And this is not only just, yeah, an experience. I mean, it's a scientific experiment that uh, again was done in, in collaboration with the, uh, within this project of the Blue Brain Project. So here you see all the elements, the axons, the astrocytes, and you can even identify the glycogen granules. So Corrado uh, uh, took many, many walks uh, in this piece of brain. And here he is in the uh, capillary. You can see him now, he moves uh, behind the capillary. And uh, these are real data reconstructed uh, with the various uh, algorithms uh, developed also with the collaboration. And now he moves into the astrocyte and he actually started looking at these glycogen granules from within the astrocytes. In transparency, you can see actually the, some uh, dendritic spines. So um, uh, that was not only, again, pleasant and in a way kind of, uh, let's say, spectacular, but uh, really what was interesting is that two thirds of the clusters of glycogen that Corrado saw were in areas of the astrocyte that are related to uh, neurotransmission, or either close to spines or close to uh, most likely noradrenergic boutons. And this paper actually made the cover of JCN because it, it really showed a new way to do uh, uh, histology. And very recently, actually now it's over a year, <laughs> uh, Corrado and collaborators in Milano um, um, used another learning paradigm, um, novel object recognition, and, and showed by doing the same kind of approaches without the virtual reality that there is in, but it's quantitative EM, they showed an increase uh, in uh, dendritic spine following learning, which is, you know, you can find it in many papers mentioned or in, in, in textbooks, but really there are only a few um, real solid examples showing this. And this is really nice work by Corrado and, and his collaborators. And uh, what we show then is that uh, DAB prevents this increase in spine density uh, and size. And uh, <clears throat> um, uh, sorry, it's, it's here. 
Uh, and then, uh, no, sorry, yeah. this is the increase in spine uh, density. And uh, uh, exactly, this is the decrease in the presence of DAB, and this is reversed by, uh, by um, lactate co-administration. And for glycogen, also learning increases the size and uh, number of glycogen granules uh, within uh, the astrocyte. So there is a metabolic response of astrocyte that accompanies learning. And so in a summary, this is the spine the size and density and the granules in, in, in red. Learning increases size and number of dendritic spines and increasing number and size of glycogen granules. DAB blocks all this and uh, lactate rescues only actually the, the spine uh, number, uh, spine density. It doesn't affect really glycogen granules because a lactate is not a substrate for, for glycogen. So the question that emerges here is, is um, why lactate is so important for memory? What's, what's, is it just, just quote unquote energy? And we thought that was not the case because when we did the DAB experiment with Christina and tried to rescue with glucose rather than lactate, rescue was not happening essentially, it was very minimal. So we did work in, uh, uh, with uh, several um, in, uh, uh, collaborators. It took a long time actually to eventually find out what was probably very obvious. <laughs> what we found is that lactate was promoting the activity or the signaling mediated by the quintessential molecule involved in learning and memory, NMDA receptor signaling. We could have thought of this earlier, but uh, we didn't. So what we, we found is essentially that lactate uh, induces the expression of plasticity genes such as ARC or ZIF or BDNF in neurons, something that pyruvate, D-lactate or D-glucose don't do. Uh, we found that lactate increases uh, the NMD occurrence here uh, compared to control and the ensuing increase in calcium within neurons, this being the control. So somehow what um, uh, and also the signaling mediated by, by MAP, MAP kinase, ERK-1-2 signaling typical of increasing activity of NMDA receptors. So again, without going through this uh, slide, again, everything this has been published, there are two points interesting here. One is that it shows that lactate acts as a signaling molecule and not only as an energy substrate, uh, and that uh, we had hints and which are, we are confirming more and more that this effect of lactate in facilitating an NAD, NMDA receptor signaling is due to a change in the ratio of NADH, NAD in the redox state. So neurons become in a more reduced state and this can be a signal for NMDA receptor function and, and probably many other proteins. And, and what we found uh, in relation to this with Hubert Fiumelli, uh, senior scientist at KAUST, and Michael Marginiano, a former graduate student uh, from KAUST, who has now a job in Romania, uh, that uh, this process, so lactate uptake into neurons, conversion to pyruvate, pyruvate then being used as an energy substrate, but the formation of NADH here will modulate the activity of the NMDA receptor, and we are still working on the exact molecular mechanism, but we have several hints. And this increases uh, the activity of the transcription, the tra mostly calcium mediated transcriptional activity, resulting in increases in about 15, 16 genes expression, uh, many related to plasticity and neuroprotection, and a decrease in a few genes involved with. Uh, cell death, which is quite interesting for neurodegeneration. And without going in detail, I just show you again that uh, the uh, lactate will increase the peak current, uh, the peak of the current uh, mediated by NMDA receptors, something that pyruvate doesn't do. <clears throat> so last uh, point in a few minutes, uh, let's address the issue of, of diseases now. Um, uh, and uh, what we described in a collaboration with Jean-Luc Martin in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Lausanne is actually that lactate uh, produces uh, antidepressants effect in many animal models, uh, rodent models of depression. Again, we had many reasons why we, we did this, not the least, just to know, because you probably, many of you practice it, 
exercise as an antidepressant effect, and it's most likely related to lactate production, not only in periphery, but in the brain. So we use three different um, models of uh, uh, depression in rodents, uh, acute four swim test, open space four swim test, and chronic corticosterone. As you know, the main uh, uh, risk factor for depression is chronic stress, which results in chronic increase in corticosterone levels. And so one can mimic pharmacologically um, the, the, the behavioral effects that lead to depression. And what we found is that uh, lactate uh, in, intraperitoneally had antidepressant effects in all these models. And we identify a number of genes whose expression was regulated by lactate in the dorsal hippocampus. And these genes in particular are well known to be involved with mood regulation. So uh, by the way, uh, <clears throat> sorry, here we go. Uh, again, to give you a hint again that NADH may be important, in one of the tests, the four swim test, uh, where we tested this, uh, we tested lactate and found, as I said, this antidepressant effect, but we also found it with beta hydroxybutyrate, which also is in couple with another molecule, which is acetoacetate. And interestingly enough, pyruvate has no antidepressant effect, acetoacetate has no antidepressant effect. So somehow there is something related to NADH that modulates or is uh, produced by lactate uh, when converted to pyruvate and is important for its signaling effect. And we are very much exposing this at the moment. So this is um, um, essentially my concluding slide. Uh, what I showed you is that there exists definitely a neuron astrocyte metabolic coupling mediated by a few uh, transmitters or modulators, noradrenaline, VIP. We also found in, over, over the years that adenosine does the same, essentially all through cyclic AMP formation. That glutamate by involving a, a complex mechanism that uh, is known as the ANLS triggers glucose uptake. And both processes lead to lactate production. And this lactate, we're discovering more and more about what it can do. Of course, it's an energy substrate because in the presence of oxygen, which is the case of the ANLS, it's converted to pyruvate and then it feeds the TCA cycle, but it's involved in neuronal plasticity and memory, uh, in mood. I didn't show you neuroprotection, but we did some very nice work with the uh, I say very nice because he did most of it, uh, Lorenz Hirt uh, in the hospital in Geneva, in Lausanne, sorry, in the uh, uh, models of uh, um, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, stroke, uh, the middle cerebral artery occlusion, uh, temporary, and, and there is a nice neuroprotective effect of lactate. And um, so this is just to remind you the, the story, but uh, you know, with uh, all the elements for lactate metabolism from the uptake of glucose to the release in, in the form of uh, uh, transporters of channels or even panexin possibly, and then the uptake uh, through MCT2 and, and all what I described. There are also some description of some receptors for lactate, HCAR1, uh, supposedly negatively coupled to adenylate cyclase, seems to decrease excitability. There is also another receptors uh, not very well characterized in the local ceruleus. But um, essentially, clearly more than quote unquote just energy. And again, you, you, this uh, article extensively reviewed uh, the role of uh, um, lactate uh, in the brain that really is, is morphing from a metabolic end product to a, a signaling molecule. And of course, uh, this took many years, actually, <laughs> I should update this slide, it's more like 40 years. And it really started by chance by studying glycogen without really knowing where it was. That brought me to study astrocytes, eventually lactate, and, and its role in plasticity, memory, and uh, neuroprotection. And of course, uh, this uh, didn't happen <laughs> just by myself, by any means. Uh, a lot of collaborators. I just mentioned the most recent ones. I mentioned the older ones uh, as I was speaking, but I like to point out in particular Igor Alamand and then Sylvain and uh, many other. I could go through Jean-Luc for psychiatry. Uh, a lot of the work was done here at uh, KAUST. I, I mentioned it in passing and many international collaborations. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pierre. Wonderful talk. And um, again, the virtual 
format uh, deprives you of your applause, but uh, I think uh, this was very well received and it's beautiful to see how sort of staying 40 years at one topic really um, advances uh, our knowledge.